Good evening and welcome to the Wednesday, November 13th, 2019 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Can we have the roll call, please. Chairman Jamie Garvin. Here. Councillor Valerie A.R. Adams. Here. Councillor Valerie J. Devereaux. Here. Councillor Jeremy Gabrielson will be joining us shortly. Uh, Councillor Caitlin R. Jordan will be joining us shortly. Councillor Penelope A. Jordan. Present. Councillor Christopher M. Straw. Here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Would you all please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. We'll start off with town council reports and correspondence, and I'll begin. Um, uh, town Manager Matt and I had the pleasure um, for the last hour before the start of the meeting uh, welcoming uh, the uh, scouts that are here in the, in the room tonight from Troop 30 here in town. Thank you all for being here and thank you also for being very good and attentive uh, uh, guests while you were here. Uh, really appreciated the opportunity to tell you about how the government in Cape Elizabeth works and show you this beautiful building um, that we use as our town hall. So thank you all for being here. We hope you learned a little bit uh, while you were here and hope that you'll come back um, and say hi to folks during the day sometime um, when the rest of the folks are, are here running the business of the town. So um, you guys can stay for a few minutes and, and watch us do a little bit of business if you like, and then you're welcome to, to head on out for the rest of the evening. But just wanted to acknowledge, acknowledge your presence here and thank you all for being here. Um, any other correspondence or reports from any other counselors? Seeing none, we'll go to Councillor Straw for the Finance Committee report. Right. Uh, so in your packet, you should have the appropriation control, the expense distribution, the revenue control, and the revenue distribution in the dashboard. Um, uh, I guess I was going to bundle in my reports and co correspondence in conjunction with this. So uh, myself, uh, Chairman Garvin, and Town Manager, and then uh, Individuals from the school board, we had kind of our, our uh, routine meeting as to, okay, what's going on with the budget? How are things looking? Um, I guess some of the things I wanted to highlight is, uh, from my perspective, I've seen a, uh, a, a, a notable um, real focus from the, the school board side of things where they're proactively seeking out additional revenue sources and applying for grants and whatnot. Uh, so they have a number of irons in the fire, so to speak, uh, with respect to additional uh, ways of getting funds to help uh, cover various improvements and whatnot in, in the school and other uh, opportunities that they're, they're seeking additional revenue. Um, and hopefully, uh, they had hoped to have some kind of general idea uh, what we might be looking at in the near term with a number of those projects, but due to various things happening in Augusta, they're now looking at potentially uh, February, we'll get an update on uh, a number of the various applications they have outstanding, which uh, may represent uh, val dollar values in the six-figure number. So it, it, it's not small peanuts, it's, it's a notable amount. So I, I've been very impressed with the work they've been doing in conjunction with that. The other aspect of that that uh, we, we discussed that was notable for me is um, we've been slowly retiring a good amount of our debt as a town over the last few years. Um, and it's a double-edged sword. It's great we're retiring the debt, but at the same time, the residents aren't feeling a decrease in our property taxes. Mm -hmm. And that's because while the debt is going down, we're, we're losing less revenue from Augusta. So we're having to shoulder more of the operating expenses from a yearly basis, even as our debt is going down. Uh, I bring this up in conjunction with, um, so one, one thing we're gonna be seeing over the next five to 10 years is even more debt is being retired, which would bring with it uh, a decrease in the amount of debt servicing. Uh, my personal view with conjunction, in conjunction with that, which we'll be discussing this next, next budget cycle, is uh, much like if you get a raise, what do you do with the new money you got? You can immediately go out and spend it, 
or one recommendation people often have is you take the additional money and you just immediately put it in the bank and you never see, you put it in an account and you never see it and that way you never have that urge to spend it. So one thing we can be doing with the additional revenue that we're bringing in from Fort Williams and from other sources is uh, setting it aside to start building up our capital improvement account, which some of you may recall had already reached the point where it was relatively uh, large and we begin to draw down on that. So. Long story short, uh, the, we're retiring a lot of debt. Our debt load is actually quite low relative to where it could be, which is a great position to be in. Uh, we do see some large projects coming up in the near future. I'll use the Shore Road Rehabilitation as an example, which is a multi-million dollar project. We're in a really good financial situation to be tackling those. Um, and we should be thinking about that as we're trying to figure out where to allocate uh, additional revenues that are coming in going forward. Uh, with all that said, does anyone have any questions on any of those topics? Right. And with that, turn it back to the chair. That's a great update. Thank you very much, Chris. I appreciate that. Um, the only other um, sort of financial related update that um, I would add, and uh, we're joined by the tax assessor here tonight to talk about something else, but I want to <coughs> remind folks that the senior tax program for 2020 is accepting applications currently, and that those uh, applications are being accepted through close of business on Friday. Um, so you might remember this is a relatively new program that we launched um, to uh, effectively help um, uh, senior citizens in town um, that are on, uh, largely on fixed incomes and um, we're feeling uh, the pressure of some of our uh, increasing um, tax bills on a year over year basis um, to give them some relief. Um, as uh, the tax assessor reported to us a few months back, the program uh, has run very well and we're encouraging um, people to um, uh, take advantage of it again. If you were previously uh, enrolled in the program, uh, notifications are gonna be uh, sent out to you if you haven't received them already. But for people that haven't been previously enrolled in it, um, again, that application deadline is this Friday, close of business. Um, you can go online, you can call the tax assessor's office or drop in here to town hall um, to pick up an application. And we'll be happy to help you out with that. Um, any other uh, questions for uh, the finance report, finance chair? Um, seeing none, uh, just lastly, um, closing out on sort of reports and correspondence, um, I just want to formally um, acknowledge and welcome the returning councillors who uh, were victorious at the polls last week in uh, councillors Jordan and uh, Jordan, who will be here soon. Uh, but congratulations to you both and looking forward to working with you again in the coming term. Um, with that said, uh, is there anybody from the public here tonight that wishes to speak to something that is not on our agenda? This is our opportunity for citizen comment for items not on the agenda. Anybody want to come forward? No? All right, seeing none, we'll go to the town manager's monthly report, and then um, after that report might be a good time for you guys if you want to head out, so. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, yep. for the, uh, for the, for the uh, introduction on that. That's great, thank you. Uh, I'd like to begin my manager's report this evening to thank all the veterans for their service uh, to our country you know, as we just celebrated Veterans Day on Monday. Uh, it's, it's quite an honor to, to have them in our service. Secondly, I'd like to wish all an early happy Thanksgiving. And third, I'd like to congratulate the Cape Elizabeth girls soccer team for successfully defending their class B state soccer title. Uh, looks like that's gonna become a trend and that was just awesome. So congratulations, ladies. I'd also like to congratulate counselors Caitlin and Penny Jordan on their reelection. Uh, looking forward to working with you for another three years. So well done. And I'd also like to thank Deborah Lane and the entire election staff for their hard work and their efforts last week at the election. That's a long day and they do a great job. So we appreciate all their hard work and efforts. To that end, uh, town offices will be closed the Friday after Thanksgiving, as well as community services in the library. That being said, the Richards Pool and Fitness Facility will be open from 7 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. on Thanksgiving Day and 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. on Friday, the day after. And the Recycling Center will also be operating on the day after Thanksgiving. As this week's weather has shown, we are transitioning to winter. <laughs> and winter operations at the public uh, works uh, facility are, are well underway. With our maintenance projects for the warm weather months being put to bed for the season, we'll now begin our planning and bid phases for next year's season. 
The police department has been providing safety training in all three schools, which has been well received. This is a great training partnership with our school department, and I know that the new chief and his department, as well as the schools, have been very, very encouraged by, by doing this work. Staff has also begun the debriefing and follow-up on the past season at Fort Williams. Some interesting numbers to know at the start is that we had 92,949 transactions at the parking meters, with 82,914 of those transactions being for the two-hour passes, and 6,533 for three-hour passes, so those two were the dominant passes that were purchased at the kiosks as well as 1,420 season passes being purchased. So uh, really a lot, of, a lot of thanks goes to all of our hard efforts that were, that were done by staff at the park. Uh, the gross revenue for that was $410,000 and the net revenue is still in the calculation stage and I'll report on that next month. Uh, but we are, uh, well, after we met with uh, our partners today from Unified Parking and we are about $65,000 ahead of what we had forecast to be at this time. Uh, we are looking to make goal and, and exceed it for the year uh, as of the close of the fiscal year next June 30th. So it's been a, a, a huge success and one that's uh, uh, been brought forward by a lot of good hard work by folks at the park. So thank you for that and that's what the manager's report is for this evening, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. Are there questions for the manager? Seeing none, we'll move on. Uh, we've got review of the draft minutes of the meeting held on October 16th, 2019. Is there a motion to approve the minutes as included in the packet? So moved. Moved by Councillor Penny Jordan. Is there a second? Councillor Adams, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? That's unanimous. Next up, we'll have a public hearing on general ass assistance appendices. Um, so uh, if there's anybody from the public that wishes to come forward and speak on uh, this item, you're invited to do so now. The public hearing is open. Seeing none, the public hearing is closed. Um, item number 154-2019, General Assistance Appendices. Um, it is recommended uh, the approval of the appendices A through F and H uh, as recommended by the Maine Municipal Association. These take effect October 1, uh, so retroactively to October 1 through September 30th of next year. Uh, is there a motion? So moved. Moved by Councillor Caitlin Jordan. Is there a second? Councilor Devereaux, discussion. Councilor Adams, I was expecting you to voice in on this. <laughs> so I had brought up this issue last year and um, it, it seemed that there was an option for us rather than a, adopting the housing maximum in the, I think it's Appendix F, um, we could adopt an overall maximum. Um, and I had suggested that might be more appropriate because the housing maximum for Cumberland County doesn't actually seem to cover what an apartment would be in Cape Elizabeth. And I don't know if the manager has more information on, on that and whether we can do that. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We did look at, look at that last year. I, th I thought that uh, we had a, the council had adopted to use the, uh, the different model to not provide within the confines. And um, we did find after speaking with our GA folks that we, it didn't provide itself as a, as a challenge this year. We did do a lot, we did do more G general assistance this year than we have in years past uh, due to some, some changing dynamics, but we didn't find that there was a, that we ran into any conflict as far as how, how it was administered. So if you did want to continue that model, that would be perfectly uh, fine as well. In what categories did we do more general assistance, do you know? Well, the, the, I mean, the, the GA maximums are set at a certain level, but uh, what happens is you can apply it uh, towards housing more so than you would in other areas. You're only gonna have a certain level of, of relief that can be provided, but instead of capping it at say $1,200 for, for what can be applied towards rent, you could use other areas that can close that gap, uh, but you're still only gonna have a certain maximum. But if, For overall. For, for overall, yeah. Because I, I had, my concern is, and I've had this concern for 
uh, many years is around the food maximums. So would those be included in an overall maximum? Because these are based on, uh, I don't know if you guys know about thrifty food plans in the USDA, which if you look at the content of a, a, a thrifty food plan, there are a lot of challenges around it relative to people uh, either having access to the, that particular um, grouping of foods as well as the unhealthy, uh, high calorie, and it doesn't um, focus on, um, I would say, mm, diet restrictions in any way. And so I just, I wondered if we, as a town, could bump it up a little to the next level of food plan, which would probably up uh, uh, for a family of two or a family of four. So say a family of four up to, uh, I think, around 100 and, um, 160 or 170 per week. Um, I can get you all those numbers. I thought I had it on my computer and I don't have it and I apologize for that. Um, but. Uh, I just think we need to think about things like that in in our town. So, go ahead. What, what we do look at is uh, there is there's still that GA maximum that that is set. Uh, the one area that we can look at, or there are other areas that we may find uh, to supplement that. Uh, if you had, I mean, we could use the Thomas Jordan Trust if that was uh, okay. something available. Uh, we haven't found that to be a challenge, but when they do. We have tried to use that as an alternative method if, if it's available. Okay. Uh, there's also the food you know food pantries that 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 tie into that to a certain level as well. But what you're saying is completely true, I and mean, I think it's a, it's a huge challenge just overall meeting meeting the burden uh, when a person is qualified within the program. It's 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 not easy any way you look at it, but. We do have the maximums that we do have, but if, we, if there are areas that we can find to supplement that, we would definitely try to, and I know Maurice, so the gentleman so that does it for as us. as long as when there is, um, I'm assuming that, and I know this, that most um, uh, GA applications come with a level of, um, of um, discussion with either a social worker or maybe Deb or somebody else that they would make it known that there are other options available in order to close those gaps so that we don't have people in our community hungry. Yes, yes, okay. and that's, I know uh, Maurice, uh, the Opportunity Alliance person that we contracted out to, that they do work, they do work that as well as they can. Okay. So, Matt, can, can you maybe phrase it a different way? Is it that while there's flexibility in the maximums um, that we can provide, am I hearing correctly though that there hasn't been, while, while there's been an increased usage of GA assistance, we haven't run into trouble of not being able to satisfy need? Is that accurate or? There's been an increase in the number of people who have Avail themselves of the program. Right. That's been where uh, that's been what the increase that we've seen on the general assistance side that has been. Uh, but as far as the overall, I mean, like the ma the maximums are set by these. Like the, we, we're going to use the uh, the Portland uh, HMFA, and that's based on persons like the household size. Right. So that's that's going to pretty much cap it at a certain level. It's right, but so my question though is, have have we been able to, for those people that are availing themselves of the services, are, are we are we satisfying their need or is there a gap? Because I, I think that that's the question that Councillor Adams and Councillor Jordan are, are driving towards. So there's more people using the services um, and, and the question is whether or not these limits are meeting the need of theirs or not. I think there's always, there's always going to be a level of unmet need. I think that's, and I I, I understand that intellectually, um, and uh, when I look at, um, and I I'm not saying that there is 
a lot of poverty and capitalism, but I, I do see that there is, there are people who are food insecure, there are people who can't meet their heating bills, there are people who can't pay their rent, there are people who can't. It take, for a family of four, it takes $64,000 to support a family of four and to be able to pay all the bills. That's uh, what, 20 something dollars, 30 something dollars an hour. People who are coming for general assistance are on that edge. And I think it would be really, uh, what I would really uh, like to see happen is that maybe over the next few months we can see what that unmet need is so that we as a town can address that. Because as you said, we have resources. We have the, um, the, you know, the Jordan Memorial, et cetera. And I think that in, uh, we as a society overall need to start taking action on helping people move out of that level of, um, I would say it, day-to-day -day angst about how do I make, how do I put gas in my car, how do I get my kids' shoes, how do I get a coat? all of those things, and that happens in this town. So if we could do that, I would like to know what that gap, gap is, and we can find it out through those interviews, not divulging people's names, but we can find it out through the schools, we can find it out in many different ways. Uh, so what I'm hearing is, um, in my understanding, I think my understanding, of, my understanding of the way all this works is, uh, there's a set maximum size of the pie, overall, and what Councillor Jordan is saying is that pie, the size of that pie might not be big enough to begin with, uh, given the costs of living in our town. So you'd like to look at, if we can only make the pie so big under general assistance, is there any other way we can put a little more in? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a good idea. What I think Councillor Adams is, and Councillor Jordan's other point is that Appendix B sets the maximum slice of the pie that can be devoted to food, mm -hmm. but it sounds like we can only make that slice so big, we can't make it any bigger than whatever the maximum permitted is. But then I think what Councillor Adams' point was last year that she's bringing up this year is that Appendix C says how big the slice can be for housing, but there's no limit saying that we have to set the size of that slice and that your preference is to just toss out that limitation. So in other words, so in light of that, I guess what I would say is I make a motion to amend, um, I, I'd move to make an amendment to the motion to strike Appendix C uh, from, from what we're proposing to adopt. Okay, is there a second to uh, offer an amendment so that we're only uh, approving A, B, D, E, F, and H. Second. Councilor Adams. Discussion on the amendment. Seeing none, all those in favor of that amendment to the original motion, that's unanimous. So now we're um, considering uh, approval of appendices A, B, D, E, F, and H. Further discussion? Uh, Matt, yeah. If, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Uh, just to, to uh, Council Strong, Council Jordan's, uh, uh, and the general discussion as well, uh, there are additional areas that we do provide, like for heating assistance, we do have funds set aside within the town budget that we do, we can help people with, if they do run into that, you know, they run into a no heat on a Friday afternoon uh, and they don't have the funds. There's also LIHEAP or that low income home energy assistance program. There are other different uh, programs that are out there that can also provide assistance that I know our GA uh, uh, advocate does a lot of that work as well to try to find any other available resources. And then there's also section eight housing that, that people can get, you know, a, a whole different uh, end of that as well that they can get uh, rental assistance with. So uh, anything that is available there, they, I will say that our Opportunity Alliance uh, has done a good job as far as trying to avail any and all resources when, the, when there is a hardship that is found uh, to try to help that. But I do think that the help you know, not adopting the housing maximum and, and having the flexibility within that, it's good to keep, it's good to keep that, that change in place. So my question, and I can't remember from the discussion last year, do we have to adopt something to, to uh, it, uh, basically our own appendix for Appendix C, or 
do we just leave it uncapped? I or? think we leave it uncapped. Okay. Okay. Uh, other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the um, recommended appendices A, B, D, E, F, and H? That's unanimous. Great. Next up is item number 155-2019, Caputa Club license. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this item? Seeing none, uh, the Paputa Club is seeking approval of their annual liquor license, special amusement permit, and auxiliary license for a mobile service bar. There have been no concerns reported by the police, fire, and code enforcement. As such, I'm looking for a motion to approve the uh, application. As could, I, yep. could I just disclose that Paputa Club does a lot for Cape Farm Alliance and Cape Farms, um, and so I just want to put that out there, but it's not going to influence how I vote. Thank but. you very much. Councilors have any concerns with Council Penny Jordan's disclosure? Seeing none. Council Caitlin Jordan, same? Same disclosure, and the family business does business with the Paputa Club. We sell occasional lobsters to them when they put them on special. Thank you very much for that disclosure. Assuming no uh, concerns with that, we'll move forward. Is there a motion to approve the application for license renewal? So moved. Councilor Adams, is there a second? second. Councilor Straw, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? That's unanimous. Next up is item number 156-2019, proposed commercial vehicle fees at Fort Williams Park. Um, is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this item? That's fine. So my name is Jim Kearney. I live at 1015 Shore Road. I'm a member of the Fort Williams Park Committee, and I also served on the commercial bus and trolley fee committee, or sorry, whatever they called it back then. So coming out of our uh, workshop this past week, we had uh, a couple of new revelations that I think we needed to um, make sure we captured in any um, proposed fee structure. First and foremost is there was a misunderstanding about the number of trolleys that were operating in the park. We had understood it to be two trolleys, and it turns out it's three trolleys, so I had sent along a spreadsheet with which the uh, town manager posted to the website. And so the first thing we did is we changed that number from two to three, which changed the math in the top half under trolleys. So we took the um, otherwise assumed revenues that the town would be getting from the trolley business. So for instance, in the 2022 column from 30,000, instead of dividing it by two, we're coming up with 15,000, we divided it by three. So it's $10,000 per trolley. The revenue of the town doesn't change. In addition to that simple change, there was a discussion about the increase in traffic that we're seeing specifically in the summer of 2019 with new entrance into the van and mini bus category, something we just hadn't seen before. So as traffic and, and uh, tourist traffic continues to boom, I think we, we should address that. And per Councilor Straw's recommendation, I think that we should move to have the season passes for those two carrier types be more in line with trolleys and with coach buses. So in the second spreadsheet that I'd sent, I adjusted those to be in line and in essence pro rata with the other carrier types. So again, if you go to the 2022 category, by that time, the, uh, the van and limo fee goes up to 3250 if you choose to go with the season's pass option and the minibuses goes up to $6,500 if you choose to go with the season's pass option. There is still the daily option, the you know, pay as you go option, and those fees would remain unchanged because they already fit our long-term goal of $5 a head by 2022. The one exception and the reason we hadn't previously changed those two categories is the park does get frequent visits from our residential facilities, so our senior housing or veterans housing. They do drive-throughs on a regular basis. They don't offload, pa they generally don't offload passengers, especially not in Captain Stroud Circle where it's busy. They're there for a quick swing through for their residents. 
many of which are from Cape, Falmouth, Scarborough, and Portland. So I have included in my recommendation an option that our residential facilities from Maine have a no fee seasons pass. They can come and go as they please without charging. I just think it's mm -hmm. it's the right thing to do. It's mm -hmm. hopefully it's fair. They're not making additional revenue by, by making their swing throughs Fort Williams Park. So that's kind of an annotation to that and it's included in the notes in that second spreadsheet. The third thing that I think we should do is because of the new types of traffic we're seeing, we never had a daily pass rate for the 30 to, uh, I'm sorry, for the 20 to 30 passenger vehicles. Those were generally just trolleys and we had a season's pass rate for them. So again, on a kind of pro rata basis, I think that we, if you look at the year 2020, uh, we make that single visit for trolleys, or I'm sorry, for 20 to 30 passenger vehicles be $75. So it would be 25 for vans, 50 for minibuses, 75 for trolleys if they choose to pay on a daily basis, and then 100 for coaches. So I think it all fits in line very easily. The math works across the boards for that. And then the fourth thing, in meeting with the uh, park manager um, who is here tonight, he has uh, designed a kind of a three-fold packet that would clearly explain the fees for both daily and seasonal based on the capacity of the vehicles. Something that would be handed out by the rangers and greeters and posted on our website. So everyone has clear vision into what we're talking about for our proposed rates going forward. And then he's also proposing a simple either uh, medallion, placard, or sticker. I think we need to work out the details on that so that our season pass holders do have a very clear sticker which each vehicle must carry that tells how many, what the capacity of the vehicle is and so that our greeters and rangers can see that because we simply don't have the manpower to be going and collecting revenues from each vehicle that enters the park. It's a huge benefit for us to have those carriers have a season's pass and have a season's pass which is displayed in their vehicle so they can be waved through get in and get out without a lot of interaction from our greeters. So those are my four, four and a half recommendations that come out of the um, great workshop that we did this past week. Great, thank you for that additional background and context. And again, we continue to thank you and the rest of the committee members for all the work on this, which has been um, very diligent and detailed. So. Did I ask a quick yep. question? Yep, I was just gonna see if there were questions. The, the residential <coughs> vans, I agree a thousand percent, a residential facility. Um, how would that be handled? Would they be like mailed some sort of pass or something like that? Or or the you just see their name on the, the side? Or, okay. Yeah, we see that on the side, mean veterans home. Perfect, and, and okay. Wave them through. Okay, awesome. That's, that, that's my take, Chris, I assume that's. Okay, good. Just try to make it easy. Um, Another question? I, I think there will be, but I, I, I think it would benefit the council, and we don't necessarily have to do it tonight, and certainly don't have to sort of copyright it on the fly. Um, I think it would be beneficial for us to pass, similar to how we had a statement of policy about um, intended use of the revenues from Fort Williams and things like that. We've had a mission statement crafted around Fort Williams. I think it would be beneficial to have us craft some sort of language that sort of memorializes the fact that the purpose of these fees and the, the, the schedule of fees and so on and so forth is um, for businesses, for entities that are generating revenue for their business off of the fact that they are visiting the fort, um, that, this is, that those are who the fees are directed towards. Um, so it's not just a casual, hey, we think it's a nice thing to do to let the, right. the nonprofits or, um, cause, and, and that does, um, uh, uh, raise a question for me. I, I know that we um, we charge. I believe we charge other towns that bring like a recreation group, or uh, maybe a church group, or something like that. So I think we're going to have to be very careful in how we word that, so that it's if, if we're if we're going down a path of creating exclusions for who doesn't have to pay, that we're we're clear and purposeful about who does. If, if that makes sense. To your point, it gets messy very yep. quickly because everyone's raising their hand. On, on the buses that come in the summer, 
if those buses are school buses associated with school activities, they come in at no charge. If they are school buses being rented or, or loaned to a camp or a church group or something else that has a fee base associated with their ridership, we ask them to pay. I think many of them end up diverting up to the children's garden free parking and we never see them anyway, so it's not an issue. But, but to your point, whether it's an issue or not, I think it, we need to have clarity on it. Yeah. So that if it does become an issue, we can fall back on that clarity. So if we could just note as a follow-up item to have the council, I think just firm up some, some directional language around that. I think it, it will get us out of the problem that I anticipate down the road of somebody else coming to us and saying, well, how come they don't have to pay, and I do, and all that kind of stuff. So, um, But anyway, that's, again, not something I'm looking to, to sort of um, freelance on tonight. But um, are there other specific questions for Jim? Um, and if there aren't, then I, I'm going to invite Councillor Straw to talk about the proposal that he's also included in tonight's agenda. So if there are no other questions for Jim, uh, Valerie, you have a question? Yeah, I just wanted to make it clear. Um, when we talked earlier, for instance, the 5,000 for the trolleys would be per the three trolleys, and that would be their season pass, correct? So For each trolley. Right. So if they added a trolley, They'd pay another five thousand. It would be doesn't matter how many times they come because they have a season pass. Season correct. Pass. If they drop back to two trolleys, okay. Five thousand per. All right. Thank you. Right yep. now, it's one company, but that could change. Okay. Councilor. Uh, yeah. So, um, if someone else ends up making a motion to adopt the proposal from the Park Commission, then then we vote on that. I'll. I would vote no. Uh, what I'd like to see us switch to is to eliminate the season pass. Um, it's basically, it's like having an all-you-can-eat buffet, um, and it encourages anyone with a season pass where they don't have to pay on a per-trip basis to make as many trips as they can justify financially, uh, even if the vehicles are three-quarters or five-sixths empty. Um, and it runs counter to a number of the other approaches we've been taking, such as we want to encourage, um, uh, we, we passed a, 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 a statement a couple months ago about how we were looking at global warming. We're talking about how we want to be focused on uh, be, being more environmentally uh, friendly and sustainable. And the current policy does encourage any vendor with a season pass to just run as many vehicles as they can. So I, I would, and also then it, uh, no, it decouples actual usage from um, the, the cost. So I'd rather see them pay on a per head basis. Um, notably, there, a number of the national, federal national parks basic, uh, basically take a similar approach where they don't look at how many people are in the vehicle. They're like, we're not going to bother with that. Whatever the seating capacity is of the vehicle, we just charge you a fee based on that. Um, so I'd like to see us move in that direction away from the season pass direction. And I'd propose that for 2020, we would have a $2 seat fee for uh, the smaller vehicles, the motor coaches, because they cause more wear and tear on the roads, would have a higher seat fee to offset that cost. And then for the any vehicle that wanted to uh, purchase a pass set at the price of approximately four single visits, would then get a 15% discount on their per seat fee uh, for the year. So that it's a more simplified structure. It creates just two categories, everything with 30 seats or less, and then everything with 30 seats or more, which would be a rough proxy for the fact that the vehicle weighs more and is causing more wear and tear on the roads. Um, so th that's the direction I'd like to see us go, but if someone makes a motion the other direction, uh, we may go the other way. Anybody have a comment or question for Councillor Straw's proposal? I do. So in your proposal then, how would, uh, how would they collect the fee? Because we were talking about a, a pass, and they're saying that would be easier for them to collect. And there'd just be a sticker mm -hmm. they'd go through. So they could get a pass at $10 a seat, 
mm -hmm. basically, mm -hmm. and then they could still bring the trolley through as many times as they want, or it, um, eight dollars a seat. Uh, they'd pay, uh, so they could either bring the trolley through. Uh, to use that just as an example, or the minibus or the van, any vehicle, they could come in continuously and they'd pay $2 a seat. If they got the pass at $8 a seat for the one-time pass for the year, they would then pay the $1.70 lower rate per seat. And then how did the, your fundamental question of how's the money collected? So if they were coming in on a one-off basis anyway, we already have to have someone collect the money. Um, if they're doing it on a, if they're a frequent visitor and they get the pass, the approach I would take would be honor system, where they have to report their visits on either a daily or weekly basis so that we can spot check as we see fit. And if we find that they're under-reporting um, and repeatedly under-reporting, we would then basically revoke their pass and we'd say, well, you've, you've been under-reporting repeatedly, first warning, just better be careful, second, third, whatever warning, then we revoke uh, their their pass or their right to come in for a year or two years, and I think that would be a pretty strong disincentive from anyone not reporting accurately. Mm -hmm. And what we've heard from a number of these vendors, especially the ones that are would be taking advantage of this, is they're already keeping pretty good records of how often they're coming in. And since we're not asking for how many heads, but instead how many runs, uh, presumably they'll have a pretty good count for us. So how do we collect it? I rely on them to accurately report to us in a manner that allows us to spot check it. So then they would pay monthly? Whatever we worked out with them. Okay. Councilor Adams? Um, I actually really like Councilor Straw's plan and I think that it fits a little more closely with our goals. Um, and I also like how logical it is, mm -hmm. but I, do think that for now we've been on track developing this fee schedule. Um, part of my concern, you know, I don't, we don't have an obligation necessarily to these businesses, but in the interest of being a good neighbor and a good business partner, I think that we, sh oh, we should give them some predictability. But what I would propose is that as we're looking past 2022, I do think it's good to always be looking three years out in this way, um, that we may want to consider moving to a different fee structure, especially if we see that, because that, you know, and we did hear some feedback from businesses that they may have to cut back on visits. So just to keep an eye on things and to note whether we are seeing fewer motor coaches, less impact, um, fewer vehicles just coming into the park, and maybe look to moving towards a fee structure like Councilor Straws as we look at 2023 and later. Other discussion? Other questions for Councilor Straw? I similarly really like the plan and concept and the equity that it provides. Um, what my biggest concern is, and particularly without having um, had a chance to um, more thoroughly vet this plan with some of the other key stakeholders, whether it be park operations or, um, you know, or the, the other you know, the vendors and other constituents. My, my biggest concern is operationally, how do we efficiently make this plan work? And the thing that I'm most uncomfortable with is the self-reporting aspect yeah. of it. Um, I, I don't think I'd be able to get past that. And so um, were we not to a point where we could somehow even do, you know, five years from now, some sort of um, basically, um, you know, like an easy pass kind of thing or something, like some sort of RFID thing. I, I just don't, I, I don't think it's worth taking on um, the risk and uh, associated burden with doing that auditing, doing that spot checking, and, and frankly, just taking some of these businesses at their word. So um, <clears throat> for that reason, I'm uncomfortable with with this plan at this time, but similar to Councilor Adams, I would say let's definitely keep this on the table and look at um, maybe a way to um, transition to this on a, on a very managed and, and purposeful path um, going forward and, and get some of that you know, stakeholder input and hopefully arrive at a better way to monitor and, and effectively administer that kind of program. I think for the reasons that um, Jim enumerated, um, I'm all for, with the way we operate the park now, keeping things as simple as possible. And I think that um, the, the, that style of plan works better for how we operate over there right now. 
Councillor Gableson. Um, yeah, I'd just like to add on to that. I, I think there, I, I also like the simplicity of the plan. I think there are potentially a couple of other models that we could look at if we were looking at re considering our fee structure, and I'd like to have that conversation together with the operators and the park management. Uh, one of the things that I like about the way that we implemented pay and display is my sense is the way that that was implemented didn't really influence the, the demand or usage of the parking areas significantly at the park. It kind of faded in nicely to the background. Um, and one of the, for me, the fee structure, an idea of the fee structure is that this is a way for the town to generate revenues from users of the park in a way that is related to the services that they're accessing at the park. Uh, one of the pieces of feedback we've heard from the operators is that at a certain point, the fees are also going to influence demand. Um, I don't know what that point is, and I think that if we, I, I'm a little leery about using fees to drive demand. I think if we want to manage trolley traffic and volume at the park, there's probably other tools that we, should, we could or should be looking at that, that are better than just pricing certain operators out of the market. Um, and I'd like to look at what some of those options might be um, sort of together with a, a range of other policy options, but not tonight. <laughs> All really good points. Um, I like the RFID idea. Now I'm like, oh, well, a badge or some mm -hmm. other scanner in the future, we definitely should look into that. Uh, if we do stick with the season pass, though, for many of the reasons that have been noted, uh, I'll still vote no because of the amount that the it's set for the minibuses, the trolleys, so on and so forth. Uh, We've looked at it based on the number of physical bodies coming in. I still prefer looking at it from how many potential seats are coming in. And from that perspective, they're paying basically an order of magnitude less than the motor coaches are. I understand the motor coaches paying more because they weigh more, but the amount that they're paying more, uh, I'd be more comfortable if we doubled or tripled the season pass fee if we continue with the season pass fee. Councilor Devereaux. I, I agree with um, Councilor, with Chairman Garvin's um, comments, and um, I agree with Councilor Straw. My concern is that when we were at our workshop, the um, one of the trolley owners said that he had about 25,000 riders, and we counted 30,000 riders. At this proposed level, 5,000 uh, times three, that's 15,000. He, they're paying 50 cents a head. To me, that seems too low um, compared to what we're charging motor coaches and everyone else. I think 50 cents a head um, isn't really fair across the board. I would propose that it's a little bit higher. My other suggestion is what if we um, adopt whatever we're going to adopt for 2020 and 21 and allow 2022 to be open so that we can review Councillor Straw's proposal and Councillor Gabrielson's um, ideas and put those into effect for 2022 instead of locking us in. Just an idea. Other comments or discussion? Councillor Jordan? Um, I agree with the uh, simplicity and logic. What I would... Um, what I would propose is kind of where uh, Valerie's going, but it ties into the um, comprehensive plan for the fort, that part of that should in would include uh, assessment of the fee structure mm -hmm. and should we transition to- The master a, plan, you mean? Yeah, the master yeah. plan, yeah. yeah. So I would say making sure that that is incorporated within that work, mm -hmm. it's assessing the fee structure uh, because I, I agree that beyond 2021 we we may want to be looking at something else so we don't yet have a motion uh, to consider is there anybody looking to make a motion on one of the proposed plans with all that discussion, I would move that we modify the 2020 forward with modified season pass rate as presented in the agenda. 
that we modify that? No, the, the modified, the one that, had, that you, includes. You're the, looking to the, adopt the modified. Adopt the, yes, the 2020 the forward item yep, with agenda. modified season yeah. pass. So motion by Councilor Gabrielson to adopt the modified season pass plan. Is there a second? second. Councilor Penny Jordan, is there further discussion on this? Seeing none, all those, uh, so uh, I'm sorry, the plan that's in there is for 2020 through 2022. Yeah, we need to modify. Was the motion? The motion was to adopt the, the plan that shows the modified season pass. So if we're gonna deviate from that, there needs to be discussion of that now. I, oh, hold on one second. Yep, go ahead. If I may, Mr. Chairman, yep. the, the council has the ability to set fees at any time. Um, yeah, I, so I agree with that. I'd rather be clear now that okay. I, I'd rather not accept something that we anticipate changing. That's right. my opinion. Mm -hmm. I'm right. seeing a lot of nods about that. Okay. So if, if we think that there's going to be change in an out year, then let's revisit that and be clear about our intent on that versus passing something that we're just going to change down the road. Councilor Adams. Um, just a question, when, when is the Fort Williams master plan completion date? <laughs> Expected completion date. So we don't have that yet. So we, I mean, we only last week at our workshop discussed yeah. them doing the work and, and um, how, that, that, how that process would generally unfold. Um, my expectation is that it'll be a months long endeavor um, for the better part of 2020. You know, I would expect, mm -hmm. you know, optimistically maybe towards the end of 2020 we'd get a report from them, but. Okay. So I think your question is, is there enough time upon delivery and acceptance of that plan to then set the subsequent years? That's, that's kind of what I was thinking, is does it make sense is 2022 too early for us to have that information, digest it, and decide what we want to do? And it'd be early enough to notify our partners and vendors and things like that. I agree with that. I'm, I'm comfortable with the three years that are presented here and um, doing the work to, I mean, this is a long game for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and the work that we're doing, I mean, this has gone largely ignored for a long time. The amount of focus and energy that we're putting on this now and the personal vehicle charges is, um, you know, and, and the associated revenue that we're gonna be bringing in. You know, Chris and I were talking about this earlier at the subcommittee meeting that he referenced in his finance report. You know, these are substantial numbers. Um, this is a substantial change to the way we've been doing business. I think that there's some value in letting that marinate in the marketplace a little bit and being able to better respond to, um, you know, any changes with that. So um, I'm in favor of the three years as presented in this modified plan. Um, so the motion that, that is currently on the table. Is there other discussion? Yep, go ahead. I had also found the inclusion of the $75 for trolleys on per visit fee, which is not on the table. So I don't know if you're including that or not, but you should have clarity in the next three That that was the default day rate, basically? If they, the, yeah. It's not on the show, that's going to be discussed. Okay. Go ahead, Councilor. Yeah, uh, so to put a uh, bow on that, trolleys are the one category where there isn't a single visit fee. So it's even though we don't have anyone currently, I should say call it trolleys, I'll say the 21 to 30 seat range is the one range where there isn't a single visit fee. If someone comes in and wants to do a single visit, right now we don't have anything there, so it, we should have something is, I think, the argument. I agree. Okay. Councilor Adams? I would just move then that we amend the motion to add the $75 single visit trolley fee for 2019. But I guess question for Jim, is it 75 continuing? It is because that part of the meets the $5 per head program fee structure we established for 2022. The proposed rates. Okay, so to clarify the amendment would be 
to uh, insert a $75 single visit fee for trolleys in 2019. I'm sorry, in 2020, yep. 2021, and 2022. Second. Seconded by Council Straw. Discussion on the amendment. Seeing that all those in favor of that amendment, that passes unanimously. So uh, to the amended motion of um, the recommended fee schedule here with modified season pass, updated single visit for trolley. And just to be clear, as we heard in the workshop, that's kind of a moot point because it's just not happening anyway. And we've all identified the fact that trolleys are a bit of an outlier vehicle type uh, and how they run their business. Um, but in spite of that, for consistency sake, it does make sense to have something there. Um, it's just not really actively an active use case. But that all being said, any dis further discussion on the amended motion. Yes. Uh, a different issue we haven't touched on yet, but just my understanding of what this encompasses. Um, we've never talked about it before, but as this is done with the capacity max 14 seats for vans and limos, uh, before we've talked about, oh, are there Uber and Lyft and these other sedan rideshare things coming in? Uh, with the way that we're structuring this, my understanding is they're captured by that such that they do have to pay a $25 single visit fee. So I just wanted to throw that out there on the record because they are under 14 seats and they are a commercial passenger vehicle. So that's my comment. Can you say that back again? <laughs> uh, Uber, Lyft, any type of sedan, right. taxi, those are all, in my opinion, and I don't know if there's some state statute that says what a commercial passenger vehicle is, but in my opinion, they're engaged in commercial passenger transportation, um, and they all have less than 14 seats. So when I look at this table and say, what fee do they pay? Do they just get to come in and come and go as they see fit? I look at this table and I say, oh, well, it seems they fall in the 14 seat category, under 14 seat category to me, which we're voting on as $25 per visit. So for whatever it's worth from my, when we're casting our votes on this, my understanding is that they're encompassed by that category. And that was our intent. Councilor Devereaux. Uh, well, aren't you talking about like a, a four seat or a yep. eight seat yep. vehicle? Yes. Wouldn't they just park in a parking spot and pay the, 250 an hour? Um, they could, but my understanding under our fee structure is that they owe us $25. I just don't know how we police that. that neither that, neither that do I, but I'm just noting that, that my understanding is that. That difficulty, I think. Yep. But my understanding is nevertheless under our fee structure, they owe us $25. So I'm confused on why you're making that assumption. Because how, how the language here leads you to that assumption. Because we say if you're a proposed, if you're a commercial passenger vehicle, and you have. But we haven't defined that as a vehicle type. Ah, uh, so I've never viewed the, I thought the vehicle categories, it's by the capacity is what we kept talking about is how we're defining things as opposed to the categories. Maybe that's the, if, if it's the category that defines, again, I didn't want to derail us, so mm -hmm. we can just vote. No, um, I, I, but, I think yeah, you raise a good yeah. point, and I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna address it in a different way too, but I, I, I wanted to be, I wanted to understand how you were deriving the fact that I'm they. I'm looking at capacity, not the right. vehicle category. Okay. Yep. Um, so speaking for myself, I, I was looking more at vehicle category and the, the associated capacity just helped to um, uh, define that per, Got it. per person goal of the $5. Um, the thing that I would draw, attempt to draw a clear distinction though in what you're suggesting is the difference between transportation and the difference between an experience. Um, so the, the tours and trolley operators and buses and all that kind of, they're, they're selling an experience that those people are, you know, taking an excursion. Part of that excursion is going to Fort Williams. It may involve going to other lighthouses and things like that. But that's, that's the purpose of somebody getting on one of those vehicles. D to the point that was earlier raised about, um, you know, uh, our sustainability goals and things like that. I, like, I just don't see any of these things as being substitutes for somebody's personal transportation. Uh, of getting to the park, to enjoy the park. So whether that personal transportation is their own vehicle or a ride share or a taxi or something like that, I, I see those as two very different things. Um, and that Uber driver is in, or taxi driver is in business to make money driving somebody around, not in, mon not in business to make money taking somebody to the park. 
It's a very good distinction. So, Councilor Gabrielson. And if I might add on that, I think that same logic helps clarify the um, recommendation that uh, Jim made about exempting the residential vehicles because similarly that is someone's personal transportation right. from the place where they live. I mean, similarly, I wouldn't expect that if, if we ever did have a city bus running from South Portland or Portland out to Fort Williams that we'd be charging those buses as they came into the park either. So um, for me, it, there's a difference between transportation and experience. Um, other comments uh, or questions, discussion on the uh, motion on the table, which is the modified uh, season pass fee schedule uh, with the amended $75 per single visit for trolleys. Any other discussion? Did you have another point on that, Matt? No, no sir, Mr. Chairman. Seeing no discussion. <laughs> All those in favor? Opposed? That's six to one. Thank you very much. And again, thank you to the Fort Williams Committee for their work on this. Uh, next up is item number 157-2019, Tax Center, uh, Town Center Tax Increment Financing District. Is there anybody from the public wishing to speak on this? Seeing none, I'll invite the tax assessor, Clint Sweat, uh, to join us uh, via the podium for some background and detail on this. Certainly. Uh, first of all, thank you, councilors and Chairman Garfin, for having me up here. Uh, and also, thank you for mentioning the, uh, the Senior Tax Relief Program. It was one of my talking points here real quick. Uh, the deadline is this Friday, and uh, it's a great program. I'll have a full report for you folks next month. But just briefly, uh, last year we had 129 applicants. This year we've already had 155, so, so it's a good program. Um, and I also want to thank my, my staff in my office, uh, Janet and Aniko, for helping me administer that. It's, it's a, lot of, a lot of lifting, and they do it uh, cheerfully. So uh, with that being said, we'll get on to the riveting task of discussing TIFFs. Uh, tonight's public hearing is required in order to disclose changes to the Town Center Infrastructure Improvement Tax Increment Financing District, or TIF. Uh, it's a technical revision, um, and it's going to address three changes. Before we get into that, uh, I do want to quickly summarize uh, the TIF for our counselors and the public. Um, the TIF was established in 2015 with the approval of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council, Town Manager, Town Planner, Town Assessor, and the Main Department of Economic and Community Development, or DECD. Um, it's a 20-year TIF, and it's based on the valuation difference of 35 parcels within the town center from their original assessed value in 2013 and the current valuation. And this captured value is used for creating sidewalks and networking them to adjacent neighborhoods, as well as improving stormwater infrastructure. Technical revision is needed to create is needed to create is needed to correct three items in the TIF. One is uh, acreage correction. Two is the removal of an exempt property from the TIF, and finally a correction in the original assessed value. Uh, from 2014 to 2013. Um, and there's documentation uh, detailing the, uh, the amendments. Uh, they're in your packets and there's some on the back table. Uh, are there any questions? Castro? Does this have any cost to the town in making this correction? Do we have to like pay any past fees or anything like that? Well, interestingly enough, uh, it was brought to my attention uh, by Maine Revenue Services. Annually, they come into the assessing department and basically do an audit of our books. Uh, last year, they decided to look at our TIF documents, and they pointed out to me that we were using uh, the wrong uh, OAV, original assessed value, uh, we started with the wrong year. We should have started with 2013. Instead, we started with 2014. Uh, in fact, the state did claw back some money that, that was due to the state because of this. Well, that being said, um, by correcting this, um, the town does benefit. Uh, for example, this last uh, 
this last tax commitment, um, $73,822 went into the, uh, the TIF account. Uh, had we not corrected the OAV, it only would have been 63895 So the town makes about 10000 on this correction. So, and, and it was uh, a number of things could have caused this, this error. It was the town's first TIF. There were new people at DECD that were guiding us. So, uh, you know, we're not here to lay the blame. We're here to fix the problem. So. Uh, and we can we can get this fixed going forward. Jeremy, um, so it's been a while since I looked at tips, <laughs> um, but my um, my understanding is that both exempt valuation in the town as well as valuation that's included within the TIF is shelf sheltered from the valuation estimates that are used for calculating um, school aid to municipalities, is that, is that correct or am, I, or am I misremembering that? I, I know enough about TIFs to be dangerous. <laughs> okay. I don't claim to be an expert, but uh, it's my understanding that exempt properties are not supposed to be included in the TIF calculation. So okay. schools, town hall, uh, and the one, one parcel that is being called out of that TIF calculation is the, the SELT building uh, next door. So, we're so I, I guess my, my question was, moving that out of the TIF sh shouldn't have an influence on the base valuation that's used for the school funding formula, or do we, do, it's no net impact, essentially. Um, and just for my own curiosity, <laughs> um, suppose the, there's an exempt tax property that is not included within the TIF valuation um, that then gets sold to a non-exempt owner, Do we would we then need to come back here to amend the TIF district to re-include that property? Nope, nope, we would simply... So we're just excluding the valuation but not the property itself? From exactly. The yep. Okay, thank you. Sure. Good questions, any other questions for Clint? All right, thank you very much. The recommended action on this is to set to a public hearing for our next meeting, Monday, December 9th, 2017, uh, 2019, sorry, um, at 7 p.m. Is there a motion? So moved. Councilor Straw, is there a second? Second. Councilor Adams, any discussion? All those in favor? Great, thank you very much, Second. appreciate it, Clint. Next up is item number 158-2019, State of Maine Bicentennial Celebration Committee. Seeing no members of the public wishing to speak on this, uh, you'll remember that in September we established the ad hoc committee uh, for Maine's bicentennial celebration. Uh, approved the charge last month, and at this point, the appointments committee is recommending the appointment of one of the citizen appointees, uh, John F. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Ann K. Hughes. Um, and indicating that a second nominee will be presented to us at our next meeting. Um, parenthetically, the Cape Elizabeth Historical Preservation Society has appointed as their representative, John F. Boyce. So, is there a motion to approve the recommendation from the Appointments Committee of Ann K. Hughes? Councilor Devereaux, is there a second? Second. Councilor Gabrielson, any discussion? Thank Anne for her willingness to volunteer on this committee and look forward to the recommendation uh, for the second nominee next month. If there's no further discussion, all those in favor of the nominee? That's unanimous, thank you very much. Next up is item number 159-2019, uh, Bottle Shed Committee discussion. Uh, there's nobody from the public here to speak on this. Um, I'll introduce this briefly and ask the Council Straw at his uh, uh, comments as well. So uh, uh, going back uh, about six weeks now, um, Chris uh, emailed Matt and I with just some questions about um, the administration of the bottle shed funds uh, and uh, sort of what the composition of that committee is. We don't have it as a standing committee uh, like our other standing committees. Um, and so uh, he was just doing, uh, asking some good and appropriate questions about that. Um, and so the recommended action here is to refer this to a workshop, but I just wanted, um, since it's on the agenda, um, to allow Chris the 
chance to sort of add any additional context and then I have a little bit of background as well for councilors that wouldn't have been on the council when the current composition of the bottle shed committee was came about so Chris do you want to go first or? Uh, sure short and sweet uh, it's basically now uh, a committee that looks like it will exist in perpetuity going forward such committees normally become uh, ongoing standing committees so we should uh, formalize such structure and um, adopt the necessary changes to make that happen um, the thing that I would add is um, for those that remember the bottle shed operation used to um, consist of um, groups applying to actually staff and man the bottle shed and then they would do the sorting that was required by the previous vendor um, and the group that worked that given month uh, was then awarded the proceeds that are associated with the take for that given month. A couple of different things wound up happening to change uh, sort of the operating model. Uh, one was the introduction of a, a competitor in Clink, which makes it a lot easier for a lot of the youth groups in particular that were taking advantage of the bottle shed operations to just hand out bags instead of stand in a smelly bottle shed for hours on end during the operation of the of the fund. And then the other thing was um, we had a change in vendor uh, that uh, uh, no longer required the kind of sorting that we were doing before. So that all being said, we landed with the current composition model, uh, which was we'll just pool all the money and have people apply basically for a grant and get, get the money that way. Um, so um, my recollection was that that was all being done rather hastily with the shifting business model, particularly the shift in vendor, because um, we, we were at the time thinking we might have to actually close the bottle shed. Uh, all together and not wanting to do that, we sort of adopted a, a, a quickly stitched together model that now I think it's appropriate to formalize and, and, and uh, put some more structure around. So that all being said, uh, is there a motion to refer this to a workshop, uh, future workshop meeting? So moved. Councilor Straw, is there a second? Councilor Caitlin Jordan, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? We'll take that up at our next workshop. Next up is item number 160-2019, uh, personnel code, town employees mileage reimbursement. Seeing no members of the public wishing to speak on this, I'll ask the manager to uh, detail us on his request here. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, what uh, we came to was a discussion recently with our new finance director, uh, John Q, uh, asking you know, the level of which we reimburse when he had to go to, uh, he incurred a bit of mileage over the course of uh, going to Augusta as well as doing some work on some software questionings he had going on and he asked me and I said well I think we're using the the federal rate and then we looked in so we're still using the main state rate uh, looking at the cost of what it is for travel uh, wear and tear on the car uh, at this point in time it's not a gigantic expense but uh, my recommendation is to align that with the federal reimbursement rate at 50 at 58 cents which is uh, employed in, in many different municipalities but it's just a question of you know, we do have folks who use their personal cars. There's additional expenses above and beyond just just fuel costs, there's wear and tear, and things along those lines. This cars get to be more expensive, so we're just looking to align that along with what the federal level's at. Okay. Um, can I ask questions to why there's th such a gap between the federal and the state? Just the state isn't funding it at the same rate. <laughs> I think the state hasn't looked at their rate for quite a while. Would, okay. would be my would be my take on that. Um, I know, uh, like on the main, I'm on the main town and city managers association on their professional development committee. That I know they're reimbursing at 58 cents a mile most most areas, but I just think the private state, sector businesses reimburse at the federal rate. At the federal rate, I, I just think the state hasn't adjusted theirs from uh, from multiple years. It would be would be my guess. Councilor Adams. Do you know whether other municipalities are reimbursing at the federal rate? Uh, most are at the at the federal. From what you know, discussion with other managers has have indicated. Councilor Gagelson. Uh, I was just going to ask. Um, I, I know when I used to work with municipalities in Eastern Maine, we had this conversation a lot because this discrepancy has been around for a while. Um, and I was just curious if we have any ongoing. Uh, the reason that some towns haven't gone to the federal rate is that there are occasionally state contracts that only will pay at the state rate. So I just wanted to clarify that we don't actually have any 
contractual requirements with the state that would require us to pay at the state rate. We, it doesn't preclude us from then reimbursing up to the federal rate with other funds, but sometimes state contracts will require that you use their rate. Go ahead. We, we, we do not at okay. this time. Okay. Uh, what we do uh, for our, for the majority of our mileage, uh, uh, dependent positions that we have in town, there are, there's already a stipend that exists out there for say the code officer, the assessor, uh, the planner, all have a, you know, a stipend that comes in for travel allotment on an annual basis that we don't reimbursing them at 58 cents a mile. It's, it's part of the annual, uh, part of the annual expense for the department. So we've already built that in. So it is extremely rare that we do do it, but on occasion, like where John had to do some of that travel, uh, it's a, it's a very rare thing, I guess. That, that you know, if, they have, if like public works have to have to go out of town, they're going to use a public works truck uh, to respond or something along those lines, or or PD will use a you know will use a cruiser, uh, things along those lines. So it's it is very rare uh, that it does take place. Harbor Harbor Master would be one where I would, but we have a vehicle but that's, that yeah, the Harbor Master yeah. can use, so. and they use that through the uh, through Scarborough. So that's part of the contract there with the services Thank that you. they provide as well. I, I think that answers my question then of what would be the impact on this year's budget by making this change? Is it going to impact the budget by $10,000? And it sounds like no. Yeah, yeah it's, <laughs> so it's, 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 it's a de minimis got it. impact. Right. Any other discussion? I, I think that's uh, the we first need reimbursement I did this year with John. Actually, <laughs> okay, so. there we go. <laughs> so we, uh, looking for a motion to approve the recommendation of the manager to amend the Chapter 3 personnel code. Uh, regarding vehicle mileage reimbursement. So moved. Moved by Council Gabrielson. Is there a second? Second. Council Penny Jordan, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? That's unanimous. Next two items are related, numbers 161 and 162-2019. Uh, we have to make a resolution uh, to uh, open both brokerage account and banking relationship. Uh, on the recommendation that we work with TD Bank here. Uh, this goes back to um, some uh, changes um, uh, from an accounting standpoint and federal statutes um, so that the council is actually um, authorizing the entering into these relationships. Seeing nobody here from the public wishing to speak on these, I'll look for a motion uh, first on 161 to authorize the opening of a new account at TD Private Client Wealth. Uh, as and adopt the proposed corporate resolution. So moved. Council Gabrielson, is there a second? Second. Councilor Adams, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? It's unanimous. And similarly for 162, looking for a similar motion to open a new account and maintain a banking relationship at TD Bank NA and adopt the proposed corporate resolution. So moved. Moved by Councilor Gabrielson, second by Councilor Adams. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? That's unanimous. Uh, last, before I entertain a motion to enter into executive discussion, uh, executive session to continue our discussion of the manager's contract, uh, there's nobody from the public wishing to speak on agenda items not, uh, on items not on the agenda, so seeing none. Um, is there a motion to enter into executive session pursuant to 1 MRS subsection 4056A to discuss the town manager's contract, which expires in January, January of 2020, January 29th, 2020. We didn't go to the Roman numerals. So. <laughs> <laughs> Moved by Councilor Devereaux. Is there a second? Councilor Adams, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? It's unanimous. We will enter into executive session. Thank you very much.